Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Neurology Grand Rounds. Uh, on behalf of the department, it's it's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Michio Hirano, who will speak to us over the next hour about a most fascinating topic, namely mitochondrial disorders from clinical characterization to precision therapies. Dr. Hirano received his undergraduate degree from Harvard College and his medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. After completing neurology residency at the Neurological Institute of New York, he did a postdoctoral fellowship in neuromuscular genetics under Dr. Salvatore Di Mauro and Eric Sean at the H. Houston Merritt Research Center. Following this fellowship, he joined the Faculty of Neurology at Columbia University Vagalos College of Physicians and Surgeons. He is currently the Lucy G. Moses Professor of Neurology, the Chief of the Division of Neuromuscular Medicine, and Director of the Merit Center. For more than 30 years, Dr. Hirano's translational research has focused on mitochondrial disease and inherited myopathies. His lab has identified the causative genes for multiple inherited diseases, including mitochondrial neurogastrointestinal encephalomyopathy, LAMP2 deficiency, and X-linked scapuloperoneal myopathy. To understand how some of these genes cause diseases, the lab has been investigating cell culture and mouse models. He has been developing therapies for mitochondrial diseases, including deoxynucleoside treatment for thymidine kinase 2 deficiency, which is currently being assessed in clinical trials. Since 2009, Dr. Hirano has also been the principal investigator of the NIH-funded North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium, so on behalf of the department, it's my pleasure to welcome him to our grand rounds. And without further ado, we may proceed with this lecture. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you for the invitation. And um, can you hear me? Is it okay? Okay, great. I see Jonathan uh, Perk there nodding his head, so thanks. Okay, so um, I'm pleased to talk to you today about mitochondrial diseases. Um, so. Here are my financial disclosures. Actually, one of them is uh, relevant to today's talk. Um, I developed a, a therapy for TK2 thymine kinase 2 deficiency in our lab, and uh, we have a patent on that, and it's been licensed to this company called Modus, which is now a, a subsidiary of Zogenix UCP. So I've uh, been working with the company, and I will show a couple of slides from the company uh, related to some work we're doing with them. Okay, so just to remind everybody, mitochondria came from uh, bacteria about one to uh, two billion years ago. They developed this symbiotic relationship with uh, cells and uh, they brought with them the capacity to make ATP through this process known as oxidative phosphorylation where the fatty acids and, and carbohydrates are uh, broken down and, uh, and uh, into acetyl-CoA and that feeds uh, electrons through the Krebs cycle into this uh, electron transport chain that generates a proton gradient that drives ATP synthesis. Um, so that the bagels and cream cheese that you had this morning are being uh, catabolized and utilized to make ATP here. And um, they brought with them their own DNA, the, the relic of bacterial uh, DNAs, now the mitochondrial genome. So the mitochondria are the products of two DNAs, the nuclear DNA, which encodes the vast majority of these uh, proteins in the mitochondria, are probably close to 2,000, and uh, uh, 37 genes are encoded by the mitochondrial DNA. Although it's a small number, it, that mitochondrial DNA is uh, essential, and each of those 37 uh, uh, genes is required for ATP synthesis. So that makes the uh, mitochondrial disease more complex than your standard uh, autosomal or X-linked diseases. Uh, of course, mitochondria are essential for virtually every cell in the body. The only cells that lack mitochondria are red blood cells, but every other cell has mitochondria. So it's not surprising that mitochondrial diseases affect uh, every organ system in the body, uh, but predominantly they affect uh, the brain and muscle because these two organs require a lot of energy. So we often refer to them as encephalomyopathies. However, uh, other organs uh, uh, are frequently affected, and I'll review some of those uh, more common features of mitochondrial diseases. Uh, so I'll start with the review of some of the, what we call 
what I like to call now the classic uh, mitochondrial DNA syndromes. And these are sometimes appear on board exams. Right? Uh, so, well, one of the first that was first uh, described is uh, Kieran Sayer syndrome by an ophthalmologist and a pathologist in, at the Mayo Clinic, Kieran and Sayer, who described uh, this uh, combination of extraocular muscle weakness, so patients had ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, or usually combination of the two. And here you can see a patient with this syndrome who has uh, droopy eyelids, uh, ptosis, and you can see that she's using her frontalis muscle. It's a little hard to see on this fuzzy picture, but she's wrinkling her forehead because she's using the frontalis to pull up her eyelids to compensate for her ptosis, and she has ophthalmoplegia. She really can't move her eyes up or down or side to side. In addition, they, these patients have a pigmentary retinopathy, heart block, cardiac conduction blocks, and myopathy. And here you can see that she's standing next to her son and her mother, who look relatively healthy, and she's shorter and thinner than her relatives. Uh, well, not shorter than her son, who's younger, but, um, but the, the, uh, these mitochondrial diseases often cause patients to be uh, shorter and thinner. It stunts their growth with, when there's early onset. And this is a disease that's uh, typically sporadic. Um, another classic mitochondrial disease is this one called myoclonus epilepsy regulatory fibers or MRF syndrome. It's hard to show myoclonic epilepsy on a, on a slide, but you can see here that this patient is developing lipomas here under his uh, chin and uh, over his clavicle. And these actually grew, uh, they became quite um, large and, and uh, impaired his ability to sleep. So they were resected uh, more than once. Um, so uh, it, it, this is a, a clinical syndrome that's defined by the monoclonic epilepsy and ataxia. And they have myopathy with ragged red fibers. And ragged red fibers are a hallmark of many of these diseases, including kieran sayer syndrome. This is a picture of the ragged red fiber here. Normally with this modified Gomori trichrome stain, you see this bluish green color of the muscle fibers, but these ragged red fibers are very abnormal and very striking. Uh, and so they're, they can be very uh, easy to pick up um, on mu routine muscle histology. And uh, just uh, to explain to you this, the reason why they're ragged red is that um, the red stain is picked up by membranes, including the mitochondrial membranes. So these red areas represent areas where there's an excess of mitochondria. So the uh, dysfunctional mitochondria are proliferating probably in compensation for their uh, functional defect and they're trying to, uh, they're struggling to make more ATP. So this is a hallmark of many of these uh, mitochondrial diseases. You don't see the, not every fiber is ragged red, um, but, uh, if you see a, a few percent, that's often um, significant. Another classic mitochondrial syndrome is this uh, MELOS, mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Um, and the clinical hallmark of this disease are, uh, is the stroke-like episode. And uh, uh, they are atypical strokes. Uh, and uh, when Steve Pavlakis and uh, uh, DeVivo, Roland, DeMarle were uh, putting together the first description of this uh, syndrome back in uh, the early 80s. They argued about whether to call this a stroke or something else because uh, these uh, presented clinically like a stroke with sudden onset focal neurological deficit, often in affecting the occipital lobe. So they often had uh, hemianopsia. But, uh, and so Dr. Roland wanted to call up strokes, but others argued that they were atypical because they, they don't conform to a large vessel territory. They're not due to large vessel occlusions and they're rather uh, cortical lesions may affect the adjacent white matter, but they're atypical in the distribution. They, they're, they can spread slowly um, as well over uh, days or even weeks. Um, and they typically affect young people. So they compromise by calling them stroke-like episodes. And another uh, classic mitochondrial syndrome is Lee syndrome. And this is the most common pediatric pre presentation of mitochondrial disease. And it's characterized clinically by neurodevelopmental delay or retardation. So they lose motor and psychological uh, uh, milestones. They lose the ability to walk or sit. And, and uh, to speak, and uh, it's because it's a uh, 
necrotizing uh, encephalopathy, usually affecting the basal ganglia and, and or brain stem, so deep gray matter structures, um, and uh, often very devastating, especially when they begin early in childhood, uh, as they often do. Sometimes there's a pearl band in a family with a maternally inherited Lee syndrome and other relatives uh, in the maternal lineage who have a milder neuropathy, ataxia, retinitis pigmentosa, or NARP phenotype. And here you can see the fundus photograph of a, a, the same patient's eye taken 12 years apart, and you can see this dramatic uh, pigmentary retinopathy developing over about a dozen years. So this is a, a well-recognized syndrome, NARP, which can occur in the same family as a, a a very severely affected child with the Lee syndrome, and there may be others in the family who are less severely affected. So we have these uh, classic mitochondrial syndromes, Kieran Sayer, Murph, Milos, and NARP that are clinically distinguishable by these hallmark features. But we learned uh, starting in 1988 that mutations in mitochondrial DNA can cause some of these diseases. So the uh, first mutations uh, identified were lesions that uh, cause Kieran Sayer syndrome and uh, isolated chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. And uh, uh, the first point mutation was also described in uh, 1988 in patients with labor hereditary optic neuropathy, another mitochondrial disease. We now know that there are over 270 distinct point mutations, as well as hundreds of deletion mutations that are scattered throughout the mitochondrial genome. Every one of these 37 genes has at least one pathogenic mutation associated uh, uh, with, uh, with the gene. So it shows the uh, essential uh, nature of this mitochondrial DNA for energy production and you know, how, how vital this uh, mitochondrial DNA is and how vital mitochondria are. So we've learned that these classic syndromes, Kearsayer, Murph, Milos, and NARP, are associated with particular mutations. So Kearsayer syndrome, as I mentioned, is due to a typical typically due to a single deletion of mitochondrial DNA, and they're typically sporadic. So these uh, single deletions are somewhat analogous to, let's say, uh, uh, trisomy causing Down syndrome. It's a major rearrangement of, of the mitochondrial genome that occurs uh, typically sporadically. Uh, and uh, these other three syndromes are maternally inherited because mitochondrial DNA is, is transmitted exclusively through oocytes. And 80% of patients with MRF have this particular uh, mutation in a tRNA lysine. 80% of MELAS patients have this particular mutation in a tRNA leucine. And NARP is uh, mostly caused by one of these two mutations and the same nucleotide in uh, 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 ATPA's uh, complex five uh, subunit six. So we've learned uh, certain rules about these mitochondrial DNA uh, mutations. They're typically, especially the, the POI mutations, are maternally inherited through the oocyte. They're heteroplasmic, typically, that meaning that there's a mixture of wild type and mutant mitochondrial DNA, often within, within the same cell and sometimes within the same mitochondria. There's uh, mitotic segregation, that is the mutation may uh, distribute differently in different tissues uh, in, in, uh, uh, during development. And there's a threshold effect. Usually these mutations are recessive, meaning they're, they're mild. You have to have very high levels, usually over 70%, to cause a disease. And so understanding, this is a, a critical uh, slide for you to remember. Uh, so you know the principles of mitochondrial DNA mutations and that's, uh, I urge uh, medical students and residents to just, if you, there's one slide to remember from the talk, remember this one because it teaches you a lot of the principles of mitochondrial genetics. And so how does that play out in these families? So the, in these families with a proband with a severe Lee syndrome, uh, and others with a milder NARP and others who are asymptomatic, the level of mutation generally correlates with the disease. So those with a very severe Lee syndrome have over 90% mutation. Those with the NARP uh, generally have 70 to 90% mutation. And those who are asymptomatic usually have less than 70% uh, mutation. So this, this heteroplasmy uh, makes a big difference in families and also makes it difficult sometimes to recognize uh, families with uh, mitochondrial DNA mutations just on clinical grounds because you interview a, a, a patient and you find out there's you know one person who's severely affected with uh, Lee syndrome or MELOS, and there are others who have little 
uh, minor, relatively minor problems. They may have diabetes or hearing loss in the maternal lineage. And, and so they phenotypically sound different, but genotypically they all have the same mutation. In the case of NARC, one of these two mutations, the loss, the 3243 mutation. So it's important when taking a family history to ask about oligosymptomatic uh, relatives, especially in the maternal lineage, if you're on a, if you're suspecting mitochondrial disease. Um, but uh, more recently, uh, we've learned about numerous uh, nuclear gene uh, defects that cause mitochondrial diseases. And because many more uh, proteins are encoded by the nuclear DNA, uh, and many more functions are carried out by these proteins. We've learned that the, the mitochondrial diseases are very complex and, and can uh, just be due to disruption of many other functions of the mitochondria, such as importation of some of these proteins into the mitochondria or uh, mitochondrial protein quality control uh, or mitochondrial dynamics of movement and fusion, fusion and, uh, and breakdown of mitochondria called mitophagy or even maintenance of mitochondrial DNA, which I'll come back to. To kind to try to address some of these these complexities and learn more about mitochondrial disease, we're fortunate to have an NIH uh, grant, a U54 grant that sponsors this uh, North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium, which has 16 sites scattered across the United States and one in Canada, and we're uh, collaborating to uh, uh, register patients and collect information through a registry. So our registry now has over 2,000 patients enrolled. And we've learned, started to learn uh, more about these mitochondrial diseases. And we, we're still uh, uh, in a relatively uh, early stage in our understanding of these diseases. The most common uh, diagnoses are multisystemic disease and other clinical diagnoses. So uh, these classic syndromes uh, represent uh, probably the minority of these uh, mitochondrial disease patients. And there are many more uh, diseases that are uh, being clinically characterized. And, but we've also learned that so far preliminarily, we've seen two uh, peaks in these patients. There is a bimodal distribution. There's a group of earlier uh, onset and childhood uh, patients, uh, pediatric patients uh, with onset in the first two years of life. And then there's a second uh, peak of adult patients. And these uh, early onset patients tend to have autosomal recessive uh, mutations, not surprising. And those adults tend to have mitochondrial DNA mutations. So we're seeing a an interesting distribution of these uh, patients. And we were able to make a diagnosis in many of these patients, um, more than half, slightly more than half had either nuclear or mitochondrial DNA mutations, but quite a large segment of this pie is lacking a genetic diagnosis, especially those who have uncharacterized multisystemic uh, syndrome or other clinical diagnoses. So we, we clearly have more work to do to understand the genetic basis of of these uh, complex diseases. And uh, we see that there are a number of nuclear gene variants. The most common ones are polymerase gamma, the mitochondrial DNA polymerase, and pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. But you can see that in our registry, quite a few of these patients, uh, or quite a few of these nuclear uh, gene uh, genes are seen in only single patients. So it shows the rarity of some of these uh, uh, mitochondrial diseases. So that's why it's a uh, uh, very complex to uh, uh, often complex to diagnose these patients, um, and uh, and our our knowledge is still uh, growing about them. So it's it's a, a field that's still um, very active uh, in research to try to understand these diseases, and ultimately we'll we'll need to uh, understand their natural histories and hopefully develop therapies. Um, the the complexity is is even more. Uh, than what we originally thought, this Lee syndrome, which I talked to you about in this context of the NARC mutation, is now been related to or uh, linked to uh, defects in more than 70 different genes, including both nuclear and mitochondrial genes. Um, and so there, there's a variety of, of Lee syndrome from that could be maternally inherited, autosomal recessive, or even X-link. Um, and this MILOS syndrome, which typically is 80% uh, of the patients are due to have this uh, TRNA leucine mutation I mentioned, uh, but there are other uh, causes, including nuclear gene causes. So there's the complexity uh, of, of these mitochondrial diseases, both phenotypically and uh, genetically continues to expand, but we are making progress. To try to uh, 
clarify the field. And, and uh, we, we recently uh, published this paper defining what the classical mitochondrial syndromes are. And we wanted to make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of what the clinical definitions of these uh, classic syndromes are. So we, we listed them, including, for example, MELOS. Uh, there was a lot of confusion about uh, MELOS and what, what was required. And, and uh, clearly the hallmark feature is stroke-like episodes that leads to uh, uh, cognitive changes, focal neurological deficits, seizures, and so on. But uh, many people were assuming that everyone with the 3243 mutation had MELOS, which is not true. Uh, only 80% uh, of patients with MELOS have the 3243 mutation, but of patients with the 3243 mutation, only uh, 10 to 20% have the classic MELOS syndrome. So uh, we're dissecting out the genetics and, and phenotypes of these uh, uh, complex diseases. So I know that um, I, this, I'm giving you a lot of information and may be confusing, so I just want to give you highlights for um, some of the red flags that we look for when we're trying to decide if a patient has a mitochondrial disease. And I, I want to preface this by saying that, you know, I think mitochondrial disease among the, the rare genetic disorders are probably among the most overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed uh, uh, genetic disorders. Uh, they're overdiagnosed because whenever we encounter a, comp a patient with a complex uh, multisystemic disease, we often put it on a differential diagnosis. Uh, could it be a mitochondrial disease? At the same time, they're underdiagnosed because clinicians don't know how to recognize them and, 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 uh, and they're often missed, especially in, in general practitioners' uh, offices. So um, they often present to the neurologists, so we have to be aware of these diseases. So some of the clinical flags, as I said, uh, they often affect the neurological system. They often present as encephalomyopathy, brain and muscle diseases. Some of the clues are cognitive decline in a young person, but basal ganglia lesions can indicate Lee syndrome. Sensory neural hearing loss is very common. The stroke-like episodes is characteristic of mean loss. And the myopathy the, uh, uh, is... Uh, typical that it presents with proximal muscle weakness, but there's typically exercise intolerance out of proportion to their weakness. So these patients poop out after walking up a flight of stairs because they lack the ATP uh, production that's necessary to, 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 uh, to move. Uh, the ophthalmological features are, are common, the ptosis, ophthalmoplegia that I mentioned before, pigmentary retinopathy, and then optic atrophy, particularly in labor disease. Now, cardiac manifestations, are not uncommon. They often present as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy initially that may progress to dilated. Cardiac conduction block is, is common in, in uh, Kinner-Sayer syndrome. Uh, wolf parkinson white or pre-excitation syndrome is a very common incidental finding in these patients. Gastrointestinal problems we're seeing more frequently with uh, uh, fatty liver, hepatic steatosis. They often have trouble swallowing, with, especially in patients with Kinner-Sayer and other forms of CPEO. Uh, gastrointestinal dysmotility is very common in these diseases. Endocrinopathies, particularly diabetes, is common in these diseases. Uh, blood is not typically affected because red blood cells don't have uh, uh, mitochondria, but there is a, a rare form of anemia called sideroblastic anemia, Pearson sideroblastic anemia, that can cause, be caused by uh, the same deletion mutations that cause here in Sarah syndrome. Kidney uh, problems, tubular acidosis is common. Uh, and then the genetics could be a clue, especially if there are affected patients in the maternal lineage. Uh, and it's important to look for oligosymptomatic uh, individuals um, who may uh, partially express the uh, uh, symptoms because of the heteroplasmy issue. And in general, as I mentioned, they often are thin and short because uh, it, the disease can stunt their growth early in life. Um, so those are some general principles for uh, looking or considering mitochondrial disease. And now I'm just going to focus on one uh, group of disorders and actually one particular uh, autosomal recessive form of uh, mitochondrial disease. So as I mentioned, uh, we uh, require a number of factors to maintain our mitochondrial uh, DNA. Um, and uh, there are defects in nuclear genes that cause secondary instability of mitochondrial DNA. And that manifests as multiple deletions or depletion, lack of mitochondrial DNA. Uh, in contrast, this is a, a single deletion that we see here with a patient with Kieran-Sayer syndrome. 
But in these disorders, there's a primary defect in the nuclear genome that causes instability of mitochondrial DNA leading to loss of mitochondrial DNA or damaged uh, mitochondrial DNA in the form of multiple deletions. And now we know about 34 nuclear genes that cause these multiple deletions and depletion syndromes. Uh, and the one I'm gonna talk to you today about is uh, this one, thymine kinase 2 or TK2. And uh, this is a story that uh, began with patients as uh, we typically begin with diseases um, and identification of the genetic defect, uh, characterizing the molecular pathogenesis in, in, uh, in this case in mouse models and then uh, developing therapies that we, uh, a therapy that we've taken back to the patients. And uh, this is a, a, a circle that we uh, try to accomplish uh, for all our genetic uh, disorders and we're, we're very good now at uh, genetic diagnosis um, because of next generation sequencing. It's become much easier to diagnose many of these patients, although still there are gaps in our knowledge, as I uh, alluded to earlier in, in our NAMDAC registry. We still have many patients who are genetically undefined. Uh, but we progress through this uh, cycle and hope. Uh, unfortunately, we're not very good yet at taking therapies back to patients, but uh, I think the TK2 story is is one where we're, we have uh, succeeded uh, partially and hopefully we'll continue on that. So uh, TK2, thymine kinase 2 is encoded in the nuclear genome. Uh, it encodes a protein that is imported into mitochondria. So this sits inside of the mitochondrial matrix and it uh, phosphorylates these nucleosides, deoxycytidine, deoxythymidine, uh, and it makes the monophosphates, which in turn make the triphosphate building blocks to maintain mitochondrial uh, DNA. So uh, this uh, defects in uh, TK2 were first described 21 years ago by a group in, in uh, Israel led by Ayan Sada and Orly Epelig. And they described these young children with early onset myopathy that affect limb muscles, but early onset of respiratory muscles resembling uh, Pompeii disease with early respiratory muscle weakness. Um, and they had elevated CKs, often in the thousands, due to the myopathy uh, and uh, elevated lactate, which is a clue that this is a mitochondrial disease. And they uh, progressed rapidly, and, and unfortunately, the mean age of death was two and a half years. So uh, it's a severe disease. And they uh, found uh, mutations in the nuclear gene encoding this thymine and kinase 2, which is in the mitochondria, as I mentioned, and essential for maintaining mitochondrial DNA. Since uh, that initial report, um, we and others have noted that um, there's a spectrum of TK2 uh, disease from the early infantile onset myopathy, which probably accounts for about 40% of patients. Then you can have a, a juvenile onset between uh, 1 and 12 years, again, about 40%. And then a minority, about 20%, have a late onset uh, uh, myopathy that begins in adolescence or adulthood. And not surprisingly, uh, survival uh, is correlated to the age of onset. Those with the early onset, infantile onset uh, disease progress rapidly and, and survival is only about a year as shown by this Kaplan-Meier blue uh, line here. Whereas those with the later onset have slower progression and tend to live longer. And we see this of course with other uh, neuromuscular conditions as well. We see this uh, classically with uh, SMA. Uh, so we uh, developed a mouse model. Actually, it's an interesting story of one of a, a patient in Spain. Um, uh, his uh, parents uh, donated money for us to generate a mouse model. So we made a Dawkin mutation, with, uh, which is analogous to that patient's uh, uh, mutation. And the, uh, this mouse has a uh, phenotype very much like the infantile onset disease, where they stop growing in about 10 to 12 days of life and they die in the second to third week of life. So it's a very severe uh, myopathy uh, and they develop a tremor and they, they have to impair gait. And, and you can see here, they have markedly reduced movements uh, as they progress through this disease. So this is a, a very good model to study this disease. We showed that uh, there, there was complete, virtually complete loss of uh, TK2 activity and uh, tissues across the, the mouse body. And, uh, not surprisingly, the loss of TK2 led to imbalances of the oxynucleotide triphosphate pools, so the lack of TTP in brain and in liver, we see lack of TTP and, and CTP both. Uh, so the uh, nucleotide pool imbalances uh, vary from tissue to tissue. 
And that, of course, that led to the depletion of mitochondrial DNA here, you can see in the striped bar. But uh, in the mouse, it's different from the humans in that uh, in mice, we see more of a CNS uh, phenotype with brain and spinal cord predominantly affected uh, in contrast to the uh, patients who have uh, predominantly myopathy. So uh, this block in TK2 uh, is obviously very severe. So we uh, postulated perhaps we could uh, treat the therapy, this uh, disease in the mice, either by giving the monophosphate to bypass the block, or subsequently we figured out just by giving the substrates, we can bypass the biochemical block here by going through the cytosolic pathway, which uses thymine kinase 1 and deoxycytidine kinase to make the trinucleotide uh, 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 triphosphate uh, nucleotides uh, for uh, mitochondrial DNA synthesis. And we did that, and we saw that uh, giving the mice just the milk, uh, they, they, they survived about the same uh, as untreated mice. But when we added nucleosides to the uh, milk, uh, we could double or triple the lifespan of the mice uh, in a dose dependent fashion. And we were able to uh, increase the mitochondrial DNA. And here you can see untreated brain, uh, the level of mitochondrial DNA here with treatment, it goes up. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't stay sustained after 29 days, it drops again. And uh, ultimately, unfortunately, uh, even with this treatment, the mice uh, die. Um, uh, but we were able to delay the onset and slow the progression of the disease. Uh, and we can see a re nice recovery in muscle as well. Um, uh, the mitochondrial DNA with this treatment. So while we were working on the mouse model, uh, uh, as a clinician, unfortunately, I was still seeing patients and, and um, some of them were very severely ill and uh, were desperate for a therapy. And this is one child that came to us in 2012, so uh, about actually 12, I'm sorry, 10, uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, uh, this month. Uh, and he uh, presented with normal early development, sat at six or seven months, started cruising, walking around holding onto tables at age 12 months. But about that age, his grandmother noticed he had trouble holding up his head and it was flopping over due to weakness. And he it rapidly progressed over the next three months and he lost the ability to sit and to cruise. So it was a very rapidly progressive myopathy. He was admitted to a local hospital. Um, and he had an elevated CK uh, indicating myopathy, an elevated lactate indicating mitochondrial dysfunction. Muscle biopsy showed severe lack of mitochondrial DNA. Um, and uh, whole exome sequencing revealed these compound heterozygous uh, mutations in the thymine kinase uh, 2 gene. So this, uh, uh, we were contacted uh, by the parents and, uh, uh, and the child was about uh, 19, uh, months old at the time when we saw him, and you could see him uh, quite floppy. His legs were in a frog's like position earlier. He can't hold them up against gravity, can't lift his arms at, at the shoulder against gravity because they're so profoundly weak, and he has uh, no head control, as you'll see in a moment. Um, and uh, you can see how his head is lagging behind, and in a moment you'll see from the side how uh, profoundly floppy his. Uh, neck is profoundly weak. So uh, unfortunately, that child was uh, very severely ill. Um, the, the, the day after we saw him, well, first we had a conference with the parents and told them about our uh, mouse model uh, therapy. And uh, we said we had never uh, tried it on anyone. Um, and uh, But uh, it was something that uh, offered some hope. So the next uh, day, the father call us on his way back uh, driving home and uh, told us that the child didn't look good. So they, um, I told him to bring the, fam the child back and he was uh, brought into the emergency room. He was in respiratory distress. So he was uh, intubated and a uh, feeding tube was placed and he was admitted to our ICU. So at that point he was uh, desperately ill. So we uh, actually called the Food and Drug Administration and asked them if we could try initially the monophosphate therapy, which we were uh, uh, testing in the mouse at, at that point. Um, and we got what's called an emergency IND. So we were able to get a chemical grade compound and started it at a low dose and gradually built it up. Um, and uh, he, he showed some improvements. You can see him 
after about three years of therapy, uh, we switched them over to nucleoside therapy. But you can see uh, in, uh, in 2015, he's able to, he's still on a ventilator, but he's able to use his arms uh, functionally, uh, able to pick out his favorite movie, The Lion King from YouTube. And um, he's uh, uh, became uh, a stronger. Um, and uh, here he is at age nine, um, riding a bicycle still on a ventilator uh, and he's, uh, but he's cognitively intact. He's learning to read and write and he's uh, uh, homeschooled. Um, and he's slowly uh, gaining strength. Uh, we were a little tentative in the beginning in terms of initiating the therapy, but um, we've learned that we can be more aggressive about uh, treating uh, these patients. And I can um, uh, please report that just this summer, uh, they started uh, weaning him off the ventilator for uh, up to, uh, an hour or two at, at a time. So uh, we and uh, collaborators in Spain uh, have been treating patients on a compassionate use basis, uh, initially under emergency and single uh, I, uh, patient INDs and then an intermediate IND in the US uh, and under certain similar ethical uh, protocols uh, in, in Spain. And all five patients with the early onset disease were alive at this point, and they still are alive actually um, here in 2022. Um, and so that's very different from the historical controls. And we see that in uh, uh, some of the patients, particularly those with impaired six minute walk test at baseline, that some of them showed improvements, including this uh, patient who was unable to walk at baseline and became able to walk uh, close to 300 meters. So that's very uh, promising. So we, we continue this on a, a compassionate use or, or what the FDA calls expanded use, expanded access uh, basis. Um, after uh, we started and, and the Spanish group actually started before us with the monophosphates. Um, and we had, had, had enrolled about 22 patients um, as of 2019 through the, our, our uh, expanded access and more than 20 patients in Spain were also uh, treated. Um, but at this point, sorry, there's a problem here with a slide. Uh, oh, here, okay. Uh, at this point, though, the FDA uh, actually mandated that we stop uh, stop enrollment of new patients into our expanded access program. Uh, they insist that we uh, initiate a new treatment naive program uh, using in uh, either industry sponsored uh, support or. Uh, or our own uh, academic in investigator study to obtain uh, industry standard data required for drug registration, in other words, to get drug approval. So uh, we were uh, surprised uh, by that, and uh, I guess it happens. Um, and so we were fortunate in having this company, Modus uh, Therapeutics, uh, uh, get involved, and they uh, started uh, financing uh, additional studies. So we um, uh, had this data in the uh, compassionate use study. Uh, so uh, the company has sponsored a retrospective analysis of all of the patients, uh, 38 patients who completed uh, uh, this uh, initial retrospective uh, uh, analysis in this, what they call an adequate and well-controlled trial. So this is the one-on-one study. We then rolled over all, most of the patients uh, from the compassionate use to an open label continuation study, and that's still ongoing. Um, and then uh, for the sake of completeness, the FDA requested that all uh, TK2 uh, patients around the world be enrolled in this uh, chart review study. So the company has been doing that. So th these are some preliminary results from the retrospective analysis of the capacitive use, uh, use of the therapies. And there were 38 patients who had uh, uh, been on uh, therapy through December 31st, 2018. Uh, they were treated for an, a median uh, period of 71 weeks, anywhere from three months to seven years. Uh, and uh, you can see the breakdown, about 40% were early onset, 40% had juvenile onset, and then uh, another about 25% or so had uh, late onset disease. And they were about 50-50 male and female. Uh, about 40% uh, were still walking, 50% uh, required ventilatory support, and 21% required uh, feeding tubes. So they were uh, all uh, impaired by this uh, myopathy. Uh, we can see there was a dramatic improvement of uh, survival. There's a blue line here representing the, here in this case, the uh, early onset patients 
compared to the historical untreated controls. And with the later onset uh, patients, we see similar uh, divergence from the normal uh, untreated historical uh, controls, untreated controls, and the p-value is quite significant. So that's uh, dramatic. And uh, we've seen um, uh, uh, that uh, the patients had, most of the patients, two thirds of them had lost motor milestones prior to the onset of the treatment. And you can see here the breakdown of the uh, early onset patients and those with the juvenile onset and the later onset patients, uh, they tend to have more function, of course, uh, and they lost all the higher levels of function. But across the spectrum, we see loss of uh, motor milestones in the majority of the patients. And um, uh, we see here that with the initiation of treatment, that the majority, a little over two thirds, have regained motor milestones, and uh, particularly the early onset uh, patients. And this is in contrast to the mouse model where we saw that there was a, a delay in onset of the disease and slowing the progression. In, in, in patients, we were seeing not just the slowing of progression, but actual improvements in patients. So we were, uh, we've been uh, pleasantly surprised by uh, how well they're doing. Um, and some, some key highlights, some, in three patients who had lost ability to walk prior to treatment, uh, they had regained ability to treat. And as I showed you, one patient who had never walked uh, gained ability to walk. Uh, respiratory status in one patient improved dramatically. A child who was on mechanical ventilation 24 hours a day was able to discontinue, and some others have been able to reduce the amount of time on the ventilators, on BiPAP in particular. Um, and feeding uh, three out of the eight uh, patients who are on feeding tubes were able to remove their uh, feeding tubes. And to show you how dramatic this can be in the early onset patients, if we catch them early, this is a child who came to us from South Korea, onset at age 10 months. We saw him when he was 16 months old. And you can see he's very much like that first patient, the very flop, uh, floppy neck and uh, very weak. And here after one month of treatment, and again, we're more aggressive now in, in treating patients earlier with higher doses. He's beginning to move his arms. And after three months of treatment, you can see he's uh, looking happier as well. And he's able to transfer the child toy from one hand to the other. And uh, in a moment, well, maybe I can, uh, well, they pulled him up to sit and he, he's not able to pull himself up to sit at this point, but he's, um, able to sit when he's uh, propped up. And, uh, well, and oh, I just keep walking. Okay, and then here he is after six months of treatment, and you can see that he's able to walk with a little bit of support. Um, it's hard to see here, his shop attendant normalized. And here you can see him after 10 months of therapy and he's walking nonchalantly with his arms behind his back. So that's uh, remarkable. Um, the, of course, the um, if you treat early, you can get more dramatic responses as we've seen with SMA, but we can see even in adult patients like this patient in Spain, we can see some improvements. This is a woman who is 38 years old. He had, she had onset at age five, was diagnosed at 35 years. So there's a long delay in the diagnosis. And she had this uh, particular mutation, and she had uh, fatigue, exercise intolerance, and a prominent facial weakness, uh, as well as uh, limb and axial weakness. And respiratory muscles uh, were weak as well. Vital capacity was about 50%, and she was already using BiPAP. So she began the, the chemical grade uh, therapy at age 35. She had some diarrhea, which is a common complication of this uh, therapy, but you can see pre treatment. Uh, she has great, she's really unable to lift her head, but, uh oh, sorry, this is, clicker's not working. Uh, well, oh, here, okay. So here you can see that she's able to lift her head. And similarly, pre treatment, she has a great difficulty getting out from the chair. And she's shuffling her feet to get up. Where is it? Sorry. Uh, I don't know why this is not working. Uh, okay. No, not able to. Uh, so, at any rate, it would, would have, if this video had worked, you would be able to see that she 
he's able to get up more easily. So um, I'm actually a little early, but I, I want to acknowledge the many people who have worked on all uh, various parts of this uh, uh, story, uh, starting with the NAMDAC uh, project, which as I mentioned, involves centers around uh, North America. And uh, we are the lead institution and it was started together with Billy Demarle uh, and Seamus Thompson is our statistician. And uh, we have a couple of uh, people who worked on this uh, project. They're currently residents with us now, Emmanuel Barca and Valentina Emanuele who have worked uh, on NAMDAC with us. And we've been supported by this uh, United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, which is the major patient advocacy group. And of course, our NIH uh, funding uh, has been critical for this. And our TK2 uh, deficiency uh, uh, program has been uh, led by people in the laboratory who worked on the mouse models. Uh, but we have a number of people who worked on the clinical side, including coordinators and our uh, industry partners uh, as well. And there were a number of collaborators in Spain and other countries who have uh, contributed patients in the years. So this is really an international effort. And with rare diseases, we really do need to work uh, um, as part of a team and uh, often internationally because there, there are so few patients and every patient is critical um, in, in the development of uh, therapies in both in terms of understanding the disease and, and ultimately hopefully to bring in treatments to them. And uh, I want to of course acknowledge the patients and their families who were uh, trusted us and uh, allowed us to work with them on, on this therapy. So, uh, went through a lot of information quickly. And uh, um, I thank you for your attention. I'll be pleased to try to answer any questions. Dr. Rana, this is Daniel Rosenbaum. First, I just want to, it was a wonderful talk, but I just want to tell you the privilege I had of doing brain cutting with your father Oh. In particular, it was an incredible experience going to his office and signing his guest book. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, but the question I have for you, how do you explain the diversity in the way the different mitochondrial disorders express themselves? If how the do, how underlying pathology is mitochondrial dysfunction. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a puzzle because you would think that they would present in a more uniform fashion because they're, they're largely due to a uh, ATP synthesis defects. So if there's an energy uh, deficit, you would think that they would present in a very similar ways, but th there's this great diversity and um, uh, we don't fully understand why. Um, uh, we, we have some clues, let's say, I think that uh, the distribution of the mutation can make a, a, a huge difference in the case of mitochondrial DNA mutations. Um, uh, I can give you an example, is the Kearns-Sayer syndrome. That's a disease that's typically sporadic, but about 4% of the women who carry a deletion mutation can transmit it to their child. And that child um, may present with this sideroblastic anemia because they have high levels of the deletion mutation in their bone marrow and causes a, anemia, which can be fatal. But with transfusions, um, they, they, they survive. So uh, and uh, th that uh, there's a Darwinian selection. So they lose the deletion mutation in the bone marrow. So that anemia goes away, but later in life, they accumulate the deletion mutation in muscle and they develop PEO and, uh, and, uh, and all, sometimes Kieran Sayer syndrome. So the amount of mutation in different tissues can influence the phenotype. So that's, that's part of the explanation, but we don't know why uh, in other diseases, they're so specific, like in labors, why is it so specific to the eye? Uh, that's, uh, it's, it's, there's still some mystery. So that's why we have a question with the mitochondria here. Thank you. Good morning. I am a pediatric neurologist and I certainly appreciated your, you know, presentation of all those patients who did remarkably well with the TK2, you know, uh, disorder. And I was thinking that has this been tried in LAYS also, because that also has the monophosphol you know, uh, pathway. And so again, wondering if we should be trying in other situations also. 
Yeah, so there are a number of disorders uh, with mitochondrial DNA depletion, sometimes presenting as Lee syndrome and other phenotypes, uh, uh, where there's a problem in, in nucleotide synthesis. Um, and so, yes, in, in theory, this could be tried. Uh, I could tell you a, a story but about this, but um, uh, unfortunately, it may not work. Uh, for some nucleotides, because uh, the case of uh, thymidine deoxycytidine, uh, these are pyrimidine nucleosides, and we have to give huge doses because uh, they're rapidly catabolized in the blood. But for the other nucleosides, the purines, the de deoxyadenosine and, and deoxyguanosine, uh, they're degraded even more rapidly. So uh, they're, rap they're broken down so fast that they really have no therapeutic effect. So there's an analogous disease to TK2 called uh, deoxyguanosine kinase deficiency. And if you give purines, uh, the DG and DA in the same way as uh, for TK2, uh, it doesn't work because those, those uh, nucleosides are broken down too quickly to have a therapeutic effect. And it's been tried in some uh, patients in, around, the country, around the world. Uh, so I know there, the, there's a company that's working on a pro drug. There are other ways perhaps of, of dealing with that. But unfortunately, um, uh, we can't use this nucleoside therapy for other diseases at the moment. Um, I, I could, I mean, I, maybe if we have a minute, I could tell you another story. This is a, I had, I, I threw in a few extra slides. This is a, um, uh, a story that you may have heard about. Um, where we were asked this very similar question about this child in London and back in 2017. This child um, uh, was uh, had severely affected with uh, a disease called ribonucleotide reductase R2B uh, disease. It's another mitochondrial DNA depletion and syndrome and recessive, and um, it's a, another disorder of nu nucleotide metabolism. And it was originally described by the French group. So this poor child had this disease and was very weak. And um, we were, and here's where the biochemical block is here uh, in this ribonucleotide reductase. And it, uh, as a consequence, uh, you lose all four nucleosides. So we thought, you know, maybe at that point we could give all four nucleosides to try to treat it. And we we uh, were contacted when the child was about uh, five months old, and um, we were told. You know, the child uh, was desperately ill in, in the ICU uh, in London, but um, they were interested in this experimental treatment. And we talked to them just uh, around Christmas of that year. And uh, after the holidays, we spoke to the ICU team again, and uh, they said the child had developed some seizures and they were no longer interested in the therapy. So um, we, uh, you know, we said, okay, it's your obviously your patient. You 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 can. Uh, you have to decide what's best. But um, uh, some months went by and nothing, uh, I didn't hear much about this uh, child, uh, but I think the parents really wanted to go ahead and try to do this therapy because uh, they were desperate. And uh, we, our hospital offered to take care of the child and the, the family uh, raised money through a GoFundMe uh, uh, effort and uh, raised over a million pounds. Um, but the hospital said no and, and uh, it did not allow the child to be transferred. Um, and, uh, and so the family then took it to court in, in England and went through the British High Court, Court of Appeals, and, and uh, British Supreme Court, and even to the European uh, Court of Human Rights, and they all voted in favor of the hospital. Um, and so uh, we were uh, then contacted in June of, of 2018. And, um, uh, and asked by the judge if we would treat the child. And I, I said, I really couldn't tell if I, if the child could be treated. Um, and then this, this, this uh, case, I hit the news. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but yes, it's this, remember. yeah, this was, this was, the, even the Pope spoke out about it when he said for them, meaning the family, he prays, hoping that their desire to company and care for their own child to the end is not ignored. And even Donald Trump tweeted about it. So this became uh, uh, quite a uh, big story, okay. unfortunately. Um, and uh, so they asked me at that point to go to London 
to see the child along with a pediatric neurologist from Rome. And I went there and the child didn't look anything like the picture. He was, he was a edematous, um, not moving, not responding to pain. He was uh, really in bad shape. And, and we couldn't tell what was, you know, what his uh, status was. Uh, we, we couldn't tell if he was not moving because of weakness or, or, or encephalopathy or combination. So we told him to get some imaging studies and uh, the MRI of the body showed that he had lost 90% of his muscle, so it was too late. So unfortunately, uh, uh, so uh, at that point, it was we told the family that it was too late to treat this child, and uh, that they abandoned their efforts to uh, treat the child. The silver lining of the story is that they had raised money, so they turned it into a foundation, and they were able to. They had a child, a second child, who was completely healthy. So, uh, uh, but they are continuing to support. Uh, uh, work in this area through their foundation. Sorry, it was the, a, yeah. The question is, is the court allowed to do that? I find that very difficult. Well, uh, apparently in, in England, it is. Uh, it would be different here. And we offered it to try the child on, on the therapy here in New York, uh, uh, but it was not possible. I wish you could have treated and if the child had improved, we could have sued back all those people. Uh, yes. Well, we we will never know now, but uh, uh, but uh, so we are we're, we're certainly focused now on the TK two, and hopefully other other uh, mitochondrial DNA depletion disorders will be treatable. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh huh. Um, oh, sorry, I, I, doctor. I, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I can see the. Hi, this is Tony Wong. Um, I uh, wrote a couple of questions in the chat. Thank, again, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, amazing research. So um, I think my talk, my first question is related to Dr. Rosenbaum's question, to specific to uh, Milas. I don't know if uh, Dr. Pavlakis can comment on as well. Uh, what you know, what's the uh, underlying pathophysiology for you know stroke symptoms uh, for the, in the Milas uh, spectrum? And uh, why it's affecting part of the, the brain, but not the other parts. Um, and second question is uh, whether um, any other ways to to target and um, potentially remove or the diseased mitochondria to some degree, or introduce the uh, normal uh, where normal uh, mitochondria uh, somehow, uh, or increase the production, uh, yeah. mitotic production. Um, those are great questions. Uh, so for the first part about the, the stroke-like episodes in Milos, yeah, the, the, uh, many of us consider them uh, metabolic strokes. Uh, they're not typical vascular strokes, although um, there is some uh, vascular pathology in, in uh, autopsy studies of, of patients with Milos. But you can see uh, the equivalent of ragged red fibers in the blood vessels, particularly small arterioles and capillaries, they're full of mitochondria. And some people think that there's, there may be occlusion of the small vessels or loss of autoregulation um, in these uh, patients. We know that from some imaging studies uh, um, uh, that there, there can be hyperemia in, in the brains of patients with MELOS. So it's, uh, it, there is some vascular component to this and, and that's the rationale for uh, giving arginine or citrulline. Um, arginine is a substrate for nitric oxide synthase, and, and so you give arginine, you increase nitric oxide production, and may cause vasodilatation and, and prevent the stroke like episodes. And the group in Japan, uh, led by Yasutoshi Koka, um, has been using arginine, unfortunately, through open label studies. So we don't have a placebo controlled trial to show that it really works, but the, their data. Uh, indicated that there may be some improvements, but that's also the natural history of, of, of stroke-like uh, strokes in, in general, that um, you know people have an acute event and then they, they recover to some degree. So we really don't know if arginine works, but it's being uh, tested in a, um, and L-citrulline is being tested as a, because uh, that's converted to arginine. Uh, and, and that's a, a NAMDAC project led by Fernando Scalia in, in uh, Baylor. So, uh, it's it's a, an interesting question and an unanswered question about this the etiology of the stroke-like events. Um, and then uh, the second question about uh, shifting heteroplasmy, that, that's a that's a uh, a, a very uh, 
uh, exciting area of research right now. People are designing uh, proteins to recognize and cut mutant mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and it's, it's possible using these custom designed proteins called zinc finger nucleases or tailins. Um, there's a new technology called mega nucleases and, and they're custom designed proteins that bind the specific segment of, of mutated mitochondrial DNA and then cut it and it's eliminated. And it's been tested in uh, cell and animal models, um, and it, it looks promising. Um, so it, it is a, an area that's uh, being developed. Um, and and uh, uh, well, let me, I'll, I'll just end uh, there. Um, uh, but I, 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 it, I, yeah. It's like genome editing in, in the mitochondria uh, universe. Yeah. yeah, and that's another area. Uh, people are, there are just the papers, uh, uh, recent papers in the last couple of years. Uh, starting with David Liu's group, where they edit mitochondrial DNA. Um, uh, instead of cutting it, they, they take, a, in this case, a, a cytosine deaminase, and they target it using the tailings to the mutated mitochondrial DNA and uh, converting a, a C to a U in the DNA. And, and, um, and then it, it, it mutates. It basically edits the, the mitochondrial DNA uh, without cutting it. And so that, that's another technology. So there's a lot of excitement about hopefully uh, altering mitochondrial DNA. And, and we have an advantage in mitochondrial diseases or mitochondrial DNA diseases because there's wild type mitochondrial DNA. And if we shift the level from uh, you know 90% to 50%, we could convert a patient from Lee syndrome to normal uh, in theory uh, by shifting the heteroplasmy. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, we have another question in the chat. Dr. Litton asks, if the location and pattern of strokes in MELAS would be more suggestive of complicated migraine rather than CVA? Yeah, and that's an interesting question. I think there's a, there's an overlap between migraines and, and, and MELAS and mitochondrial diseases. A lot of the patients with uh, MELAS have uh, migraine-like headaches. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so there is a relationship here that we don't fully understand. It's, you know, people have looked at patients with complicated migraines and for mitochondrial DNA mutations and haven't found them, but there may be some common etiology here that, that uh, perhaps involves mitochondria uh, that we, we just don't understand uh, with the complicated migraines. But yes, there's some overlap here that's intriguing uh, and, and uh, needs, uh, needs a smart person to figure out if there is a, a connection here. Um, I had a question. So you spoke about uh, cognitive decline in a young person being a red flag for the possibility of mitochondrial disease. If someone has uh, dementia, early onset dementia, the absence of other multisystemic involvement, would you still consider mitochondrial disease in the differential? Um, I generally don't if it's just pure dementia in a, a young person, um, because typically we see, you know, uh, multiple symptoms and signs in patients with mitochondrial disease, even hearing loss, the ptosis, uh, the myopathy. So isolated dementia, I, I think, would be very uncommon. Um, and similarly, I think people have tried to link autism to mitochondrial uh, disease, and, um, and rarely is autism, uh, uh, pure autism, a, a mitochondrial disease. You may have autistic spectrum disorder in mitochondrial disease, but it's usually in the setting of other problems. They, they may have Lee syndrome or they may have hearing loss and uh, other neurological problems. So pure autism is not a mitochondrial disease, but um, you, you can see uh, mitochondrial disease pre presenting with autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, so uh, it's, but again, it, it, usually there are clues clinically that there's, there are multiple organs or systems involved um, that, that indicate mitochondrial disease. Thanks, Dr. Hirano, for your presentation. This is Yusuf, I'm a neurology resident. Uh, my question, Dr. Hirano, uh, I know the mitochondrial disease, it's hard to do genetic testing before uh, uh, the, before conception, but could we do like provide genetic counseling for the family? Because the, I think at this moment, the most, most of the thing is we can do the prevention. 
Yeah. So okay. anything about that? Yeah, so th this is a, a very uh, important question. And, and, you know, because women who carry mitochondrial disease, uh, mitochondrial DNA mutations are at risk of transmitting to all their children and developing, having children with severe mitochondrial diseases. Um, and and it, 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 it's less predictable than, than nuclear gene defects. We don't know the level of heteroplasmy um, uh, unless we do some sort of intervention. So there are a couple of options. One is, um, to do in vitro fertilization and to do uh, PGD, pre-implantation gen genetic diagnosis, where we, uh, uh, where people will sample the embryos and measure the level of mutation, mitochondrial DNA mutation in the embryo. And so uh, if there are embryos with very low levels of, of the mitochondrial DNA mutation, they can be implanted and the risk of having a, 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 a child with a disease is, is reduced. Um, but that you have to have pretty low levels, below generally 30 percent, to to be reasonably sure that uh, uh, the child is unlikely to develop mitochondrial disease. Unfortunately, many of these embryos have between 30 and 70 percent mutation, and we we don't know what to do with the, those in that situation. If the, that's the best embryo um, in terms of the heteroplasmic level, it, whether you know it, it's probably unsafe to to implant that embryo if you want to, you know, if the goal is to have a, a healthy child. So uh, pre-implantation genetic uh, diagnosis is, is limited, but it is being done. Um, and then another technique, which is technically feasible and is being done in, in the UK is to do a mitochondrial replacement technique. We have a, a, a mother who has a mitochondrial DNA mutation and her uh, uh, partner, uh, go through IVF, and then in parallel, there's a, a woman who has normal mitochondrial DNA who donates an oocyte, and you can transfer after either at the oocyte level, the nuclear DNA from one oocyte into the cytoplasm of the mitochondrial DNA uh, oocyte, which, uh, uh, which is completely uh, normal, and then do the in vitro fertilization, or you could do the in vitro fertilization first and then take the pronucleus from one embryo and transfer it into the cytoplasm of another uh, uh, embryo. And in, in, in the end, you end up with uh, uh, an embryo with uh, three biological parents, the nuclear DNA of the mother father and the mitochondrial DNA from a mitochondrial DNA donor. And some people have called that um, uh, three parent embryos uh, and uh, others. I, I don't like the term three parent embryos because I don't think a mitochondrial DNA donor counts as a parent. Uh, so I, I, for a three-person embryo, perhaps. Um, but uh, it's, 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 it's uh, forbidden in the United States because of uh, legislation that, that considers this a form of genetic manipulation. But uh, it is being done in England. It was uh, uh, approved by the British uh, Parliament because uh, a famous neurologist, Lord Walton, was sitting in the Parliament and was working in Newcastle with the Newcastle Group uh, and, and uh, advocated for this. And so the legislation went through. And, and so this is being uh, done in England. We don't know the results yet. So there, there, there's this uh, technology which is available and, and theoretically should work. And actually, there was one case. It was uh, done here in New York. Uh, uh, John Zhang, who runs an IVF clinic, did this OSI transfer on a woman who had uh, the NARP mutation and had uh, miscarriages and two children with Lee syndrome and was desperate to have her own child. And so she came to New York. He did the uh, mitochondrial replacement, the oocyte level, did the in vitro fertilization in New York, and he flew the embryo, the mother and himself to Mexico to implant the embryo, and it was published. And the child uh, is apparently healthy with less than 10% uh, mitochondrial DNA you know, mutated mitochondrial DNA in all tissues tested. So uh, that again, it's proof that the that this technique can work, but as I said, it's, it's forbidden in this country. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but <laughs> does that answer your question? Uh, so we have one last question and then uh, we can surely wrap up. Uh, Dr. Jin, uh, stroke neurologist asks, uh, practical recommendations for screening suspected patients for MELAS? Yeah, so uh, it's, if you think the patient may have MELAS uh, uh, and, and um, you know, you could uh, 
and there's a suggestion there's mitochondrial inheritance, you could just sequence the entire mitochondrial DNA. The, uh, the cost of sequencing has gone down dramatically, and by next generation sequencing, we can detect mutations down to very low levels um, in blood or other tissues, uh, buccal swab. So um, actually, it's better probably to do buccal swab uh, um, testing than, than blood, because usually the level is higher in, in uh, cheek swabs. So uh, I, I would send off uh, 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 a buckle swab to a commercial company for, for a mitochondrial, whole mitochondrial DNA sequencing. That way you can get not only the 3243, but any other mitochondrial DNA mutation that could cause me loss. And there are over 25 different mutations of mitochondrial DNA that linked, have been linked to me loss. Uh, I think we can wrap up now, but this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank Bye. you.